start? with uh, introduction and launching of a new degree uh, in our department. It's a Master of City Design. Um, however, it's received as enhancement and complementary and synergetic activity to all our degrees that we have in the department, including our undergrad degree in urban studies. We also have a long-standing professionally accredited program in urban planning and policy and our PhD degree. So again, we see that as part of our education and degree, degree programs, we also want to see um, them benefiting and also pushing the, the, the edge of you know, how we think about urban um, at various scales and how we uh, use the hindsight and foresight to shape uh, our thought about uh, practice um, as well as education and academic research. So with that, I'd like to pass to uh, my uh, colleague, Um, it's a pleasure welcoming you all um, uh, on a wet Friday afternoon. Uh, you know, I would think twice if I have to show up. So I admire uh, that you took out the time and made the effort to, to join us on uh, today. Uh, it's a pleasure welcoming the three people on dais. Um, um, uh, I'll start with uh, uh, Professor Doug Kelbog, also Dean Emeritus. Uh, University of Michigan Ann Arbor um, at the Taubman College. Um, and um, Doug, um, his work, the way I think of his work, and it's a long and illustrious body of work uh, spanning uh, several decades, is uh, that sort of brings together ideas about design and sustainability and cities together. Doug, is that a fair? Yeah, I wish it was several decades. It's been okay. five and a half. <laughs> wow. So that's, you know, uh, I was not way off the mark, but uh, starting with solar uh, solar houses, uh, and then, but Doug's work also sort of straddles both practice uh, of design as well as teaching and research in the world of design. And his latest book uh, is is here, and there are several more in two more in pipeline as we speak, right? Two more in the pipeline. Is that I'm the writing two more books? No. No, okay, <laughs> so this is- Maybe one more. Maybe one more, right? There's always, he always has one or two ideas up the sleeve. Uh, and Doug, uh, 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 he is one of the few people, in addition to, to uh, 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 Professor Robert Fishman, whom I would come to in a minute, who has always talked about this idea of, of uh, bringing together architecture, urban design, and urban planning. Uh, one of the first few things he did when he became the dean at, at uh, Taubman College was to create a program in urban design. Uh, uh, and both of them uh, held full professorships across three disciplines, right? You were professors of architecture, urban planning, as well as urban design. In many ways, this, this close relationship between the three, uh, though, Modern academia, as we know, tries to discipline practice into discrete domains of knowledge. We try to divvy up one for the sake of uh, 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 mostly faculty's comfort rather than, rather than what happens in the field, where, it's practical, where practice actually encourages mixing of ideas from, from different fields. So both of them, their work sort of speaks to this uh, idea, and that's one of the major motivation of inviting them uh, for this conversation where we have our inaugural cohort in place is how practitioners sort of combine ideas and what we are calling craft of city design today, uh, bringing together these distinct ideas. 
Our second speaker for today, Professor um, Bob Fishman. Um, I don't want to introduce him too much because if you don't know Bob already, perhaps you are at the wrong event. <laughs> you shouldn't be here. Uh, everyone who, who works in this area knows Bob Fishman. Uh, most, perhaps one of the most uh, prominent scholars of American uh, planning history, including um, incredible work on, on suburbia. And um, finally, the moderator for today, uh, uh, our new hire, in, in the city design, in, in the Department of Urban Planning and Policy, uh, Professor Shivin Yildiz. Shivin comes to us from, uh, from New York and before that Western Europe and before that Istanbul. So she has a global orientation um, and, uh, and someone whose sort of work um, lies at the intersection of ecological planning, uh, grand infrastructure, uh, and, and ideas about how urban design sort of emerges as a distinct practice in the post-war period based on, on, on um, um, ideas about infrastructure and ecological planning. Um, she'll moderate uh, the event, and now I'll hand over the baton to her. Okay, well, uh, thank you Zoritza and Sanjeev for uh, your introductions. I'm very happy and honored to be here with two esteemed speakers today, and thank you for coming out on this wet day. As Sanjeev was saying, uh, a challenging day to reach anywhere. So, um, well, we were, we were talking and speaking about the craft of city design, with both with my colleagues and our students in classroom environments. And perhaps I want to start with that because you were also invited uh, with this title. So what do you, thinking of the multiple ways of interpreting urban design and its background and its history, how it came from multiple strands of thinking, from object-oriented design movements to interrelationships, from the political aspect of it, what do you make, first of all, simply of the word or the concept craft of city design. Just let me, maybe five minutes of introductions do, before do you, we go into this. Or do you want to see the slides first? I mean, you can, you can do the slides with that, yeah. yeah. Okay, what, you, you want me to start? You want to start? Okay, well, well, uh, Do you want to go yes, onto okay. your slides? Okay. okay. Yeah, he's yeah, the I, historian. <laughs> I had that, yes, yes. I mean, it's, it's true that I teach in uh, the programs of architecture, urban planning and urban design, but in fact, I'm not an architect, urban planner, uh, or an urban designer, I'm an historian. And uh, perhaps you're in a bit of trouble if you turn to an historian to, to, to deal with uh, the present and the future, but that's the, uh, that's the case. So uh, I, you know, I, I've been thinking about this, you know, the challenge, and I, I should say, first of all, that you know, this, is, this is a great honor to be here uh, at the start of a major program in urban design, uh, you know that, and I think it's one of the one of the best things that's happening right now in our culture. And I say this to to, your, to the students themselves: uh, is this uh, upsurge in interest in uh, the art and craft of urban design, uh, the excitement that's uh, centering on cities, is you know is as I say. Uh, a wonderful addition. We can't have, we can never have too many urban designers. <laughs> and so I, uh, I, I'm, I'm pleased that this, very pleased that this new program. Thinking about the, the state of urban design, the, 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 state of, the state of urban design, which was kind of our, our challenge, uh, I, was, I was inspired by Doug's book, The Urban Fix. I brought my own copy. And I, I want to say, you know, Doug is too modest to say this, but I'll say it, buy this book. I have a few for sale. <laughs> right, yes. He, he, brought a, he brought a few copies there. But uh, thinking about some of, some of the themes, uh, I was led to a perhaps far-fetched comparison between climate science and urban design. And by that I mean, you know, I don't want to, to claim for urban design uh, the genius of climate science. I think you know, that by any standards, the ability of the, cl of the climate scientists to create out of a very uncertain set of uh, empiric a complex set of empirical data models that have compelled the ascent 
of every honest scientist and policymaker is to me probably the greatest achievement of recent science. Uh, but as we all know, the tragedy to me of urban science is, this, the, of, of climate science, is that the climate scientists have done their job and yet there is this uh, canyon, this gulf, between what they seem to be compelling us to do and what we're actually doing. Uh, the science is there and yet the, uh, <clears throat> you know, the transformation in, in, you know, in modern life is not. And my comparison with urban design is, is this, that I think that the, over the last 50 years, urban design has made tremendous strides in terms of envisioning, uh, de uh, designing, uh, coming up with a theory of the kind of compact, uh, walkable, transit-oriented, uh, ecologically focused communities that we absolutely need. And yet, the actual impact of this, uh, you know, of this degree of urban, urban design uh, has, not, has not been seen. So I just, I just want to, as a, as, a, as a kind of proof, I think, of what urban design is capable of, uh, I just want to show you, we were asked to present, you know, 10 slides or something, something of that sort. Uh, a community many, perhaps many of you, uh, many of you know, and that's uh, Hammerby Schostadt, uh, about three miles south, southeast of, of Stockholm. Uh, a new town that was uh, started around 1997, 19, 1998, and uh, to me, embody, I only saw, I, I happened to visit Stockholm for the first time two years ago, thanks to our mutual friend, friend T, Tigran. I only saw this place then, and I was simply blown away by the, you know, by the way in which they'd really put everything together. And what to me is most extraordinary is that it wasn't done as this kind of demonstration project by, uh, by architects with unlimited budget. It was a, it's a real place that was you know, essentially planned by the Stockholm municipal planners, built by local developers to show uh, essentially, yeah, essentially, let's see what we have here. This is, this is uh, the master plan uh, to basically show that yes, we can build relatively dense, walkable communities that are uh, ecologically conscious, transit-oriented development, that all of these things really do fit together. Uh, the basic concept was it's a kind of uh, a critique of the earlier uh, Swedish new towns uh, that by our present standards were uh, you know, far too dispersed from the center, uh, far, far less dense than they could have been to create real communities, uh, to go back in many ways to the density uh, and, <clears throat> and the uh, basic uh, courtyard design and <clears throat> quadrangle design uh, of the traditional, sto of traditional Stockholm. Uh, in other words, to, to uh, reproduce something, you know, this is, this is an older street in the, ce in the center of the city. Uh, here is Hammerby, in which, you know, a, a, you know, a kind of medium density, uh, a wonderful uh, approach to the ecology of water, especially, and recycling of water, uh, a, a whole, a whole uh, I think what, you know, what Hammerby shows is that the different elements of urban design really do come, can really come together uh, and be mutually reinforcing an important point that Doug makes in his book, Urban Fix. So this is walkable, this is mixed use with, a, uh, with, with jobs. Uh, <laughs> the city built a kind of an extension of their light rail, their wonderful light rail system uh, right, to, right to Hammerby so that, uh, which connects to the subway system. As I say, it's, 
uh, mixed use at the level of the buildings, uh, tremendous attention to, uh, <clears throat> to these courtyard designs that have both a density as well as uh, open space, sun sh sunshine views down to, uh, <clears throat> uh, da down, down to the lake. Uh, in other words, the, to me, this is a sign uh, that urban design can create, has, you know, has reached the level of sophistication uh, to be a real alternative to the kind of conventional building and sprawl we have today. And the issue, again, what, you know, what, what, uh, what struck me about Hammerby, what, what's bothered me ever since is, why are we doing so little of this? Why, you know, why is this a kind of thing that you go all the way to Sweden to see and not something you see every day? Uh, what are the barriers uh, to, you know, to, this, to, to the full implementation of urban design? And I think I'll just stop there with, that, with that, those questions to myself and, and to you because that to me is where we're at. The theory, uh, the theory of urban design is there, the potential is there. So little is actually done, uh, being done at a time when we need it so much. Great, well thank you. We'll come back, but maybe, you okay. know. I, okay, I hate to be right in front of this screen, but I guess I'll move over here as far as I can. So if we could start with the first thing, yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you when. So, first of all, uh, the hard act to follow. Let's see. I need to be close to this, don't I? Yeah. Um, I'll get this out of the way. Of the many fact, no, no, don't take that. Okay. <laughs> all right. Of the many, now you can have those. Uh, of the many faculty I had the honor of hiring, this guy was the best. Uh, he's heard me say that yeah. many times. Um, I would say he's the preeminent, preeminent historian of urban design uh, with a small U and a small D, just the design of cities. Um, so the built environment is, is a big deal. Most people don't realize that it's the biggest economic investment a society makes. It's more than education, more than healthcare, more than defense. Uh, and it's one of the most empowering and monumental achievements of any society. Long lived, buildings and cities embody culture. They make connections across the past, the present, and really point to the future. So why is it so relevant right now to build on Robert's comments? <clears throat> well, it's been underappreciated in this country, going right back to Thomas Jefferson who was anti-urban, frankly, although he spent a lot of time in Paris. He never complained about Paris, but he really didn't, he saw the, what was it, the country yeoman farmer, and that was the, the American model. So um, we also tried to have it both ways with suburbia in the 1950s on. You know, we could have cities and suburbs, we thought, it didn't really work out. And then this whole emphasis on single buildings by Starkitex uh, has dominated the media for so long. Here's your city, an example of some great urban design, um, a place you all know well. So that's one reason. Another reason is just the tsunami of global urban development. This is Shanghai. But throughout Asia, India, the growth rates are astounding and I mean, in this photo here of Shanghai, probably all the buildings above five stories are, real, you know, 10 years old or less. It's, uh, it's unprecedented. Um, to the extent that in 1800, there were about 30 million people living in cities, about 3% of the world population. Now, <clears throat> it's about 55%, uh, and it's about 4 billion people, uh, and climbing. Urbanization in the developed world, to a large extent, places like the U.S. have sort of played out. 
uh, the people who move from farmland to, to cities has pretty much played itself out. Uh, but this same mass migration at a much larger scale is running its course now in the rest of the world. So here are 300 cities, their size shown by the diameter of their circle. More than half of humanity, as we said, I said, lives in cities, but it might come as more of a surprise to learn that these 300 largest cities account for a half the world economic output. And it does it with about 20% of the world population. So they, cities box way above their weight, uh, roughly two and a half times. Uh, they do two and a half times their share um, in economic cloud and muscle, whatever. Um, China is developing mega cities at 10 times the U.S. rate, and in spite of their recent one-child policy, uh, they still aren't having very, even though that's been uh, repealed, they still have small families. Uh, by 2050, developing world cities are projected to gain 2.3 billion people. That was on top of 4 billion already. Many of those people will move to makeshift settlements, favelas, whatever, informal settlements, on the edge of existing cities, tripling the urbanized land area in the developing world. There's a big interchange in China below. You can, if, how many people have been to China? Yeah, it's pretty remarkable. Uh, is it, how about, how many people are from China? Nobody, okay. Um, it's unprecedented. Um, and it's pretty fast growing also in Central and South America. This is Mexico City. It goes on forever. It's, it's bigger than Metro New York now, I think. Uh, one of the biggest cities in the world. Um, and the third reason is this ecological crisis we're in, climate change. That term has changed. When I was in school, we were talking about energy after the oil embargo of 72. It was energy, and then it was about environment, and then it was about ecology, and then it was about sustainability, and then resilience and, and climate change. It's interesting how the term has changed, but the idea is basically one continuous evolution. Um, so climate change is the big deal. This is Boston with a not that big a sea level rise. We forget that much of Boston is built on landfill. Uh, there are many cities, coastal cities all over the world that are threatened um, by sea level rise and not by major sea level rise. Um, uh, and we know we're threatened by more flooding because there's more, as the air gets warmer all over the planet on average, it can hold more water vapor so it can have bigger bigger rainstorms and you know about you've read about forest fires and drought and wind and so on it's it's just getting i would say extreme weather is the way to describe it it's just getting more dis extreme in every way that's weather that's not climate there are two distinct things weather being a local manifestation of climate so cities account for more than 70% of global CO2 emissions, uh, and they consume two-thirds of the world's energy, uh, and yet they're good. How could they be good? That's my last slide, so I, I'll have to extemporaneously tell you why they're good. It's because people who live in cities have smaller eco footprints. Um, why? Well, they live in smaller dwelling units which share walls, floors, and ceilings with other units. So there's less energy to heat them and to cool them. It takes less materials, which in turn embody energy uh, to build the buildings. Uh, so the buildings are better, but most importantly, people can walk and bike and take transit more, transit-oriented development, which came out of a design charrette we did at the University of Washington about 30 years ago. 
uh, originally called pedestrian pockets and then later changed to TOD. That all started at an academic charrette, which was focused on urban design. Um, so transportation is, is a big chunk. Americans have, of all the pies that are sliced around the world, transportation's biggest in the United States. Uh, close to 30% of the energy pie. And that's because we are auto dependent, uh, not just in the suburbs, but throughout the city. Not so much in Chicago. You're lucky to have this wonderful transit system, um, which I was going to use to get here, but I actually, because it was raining, <laughs> didn't. Um, but I used, I've used, I used it yesterday when we went to a big event in honor of the Center for Neighborhood Technology. Scott <laughs> Bernstein, do you know the Center for Neighborhood Technology? If you don't, you got to know about it. It's world class. Scott co-founded it. They had a big anniversary last night. John Norquist was there and others. Um, John, we're lucky to have here, the former mayor of Milwaukee and former head of Congress for New Urbanism. Some, an asset that I hope your program takes advantage of, as well as Scott. Um, so transportation, heating, lighting, actually lighting buildings is more expensive in cities. It takes more energy because the buildings are more compact and mixed use, there's not as much daylight. Subur suburbia does have bigger uh, windows and more windows and more daylight. But they all, these bigger buildings take more materials to build and to heat and cool. Um, so it's mainly about transportation and about how we live, density, compactness. Uh, it's got to be mixed use density though, so people have places nearby that are worth walking to, places they want to walk to. Have you heard of walk score? How many people have heard of walk score? How many people know their walk score? <laughs> it's a good thing to do. Go to mywalkscore.com. You can do it very quickly. Uh, we live in downtown Ann Arbor, which is actually quite urban. We have a walk score of 99, which is about as high as you can get. Uh, I don't know if there's any place in Chicago that has a walk score of 100. There are some places in, in Manhattan that do. So even in little downtown Ann Arbor, the walk score can be extremely high. But does anyone have a walk score above 90 in this group? Okay, above 95? How high? 97. 97. So you can imagine 99. I'm pretty proud of that. Uh, we hardly drive anywhere. About 3,000 miles a year. Um, you can also get your bike score and your transit score at that site. So transportation, the buildings themselves, industry is the other big slice of the pie, and industry is getting cleaner as well. So cities are a big solution. Now, in the developing world, what happens is people are still moving from the countryside, from farming to the city. And when they move to the city, their income goes up dramatically. So their footprint goes up. But their birth rate goes down faster than their eco footprint goes up. In other words, they're richer, they buy more, they spend more on fuel, this, that, and the other, but their birth rate goes down because children are a liability in the city, they're an asset in the countryside, and their birth rate goes down faster than uh, their consumption goes up. So these people migrating to cities are helping the planet. Um, this is a major revelation I came across writing this book. Um, Perhaps, maybe can we open? That's enough. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, uh, because this brings up a really interesting scale question, which I had in mind. So that's a great seg into that question for both of you. I know in your works, you, you did comparisons with grids of Dubai and Manhattan, the grid systems comparatively, globally comparative. And you have talked about um, how 
uh, the suburban division, despite all its dysfunctions, is still a resilient structure, substructure. Yeah. And you said maybe uh, archipelago of different uses and neighborhoods could be the future solution. So you're talking about really about an expansive, massive urbanization on one hand, and best practices like uh, the one in Stockholm, so the neighborhood scale. So how should we actually prepare future urban designers for a scale of intervention when we have this complicated question of having both the massive urban sprawl on one side and also having a, a chain of network of archipelagos working together. So what should be the scale here like of intervention for any urban, future urban designer? What should they keep that in mind? Okay, well, I think, yeah. I mean, I think a key scale element is the walking radius of the human being. And then maybe the biking radius. Um, that should... At places where that's not the option, like... Like where? Like walking still, you think walkability is a... Is, 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 uh, it's a good scale of intervention for urban. Right. Okay. So, I mean, I think those two radii are good measurements. Uh, the auto radius is irrelevant and a disaster because, you know, you can drive forever. Um, maybe how long it takes to go on a, how far you can go on a bus in 15 minutes might be another radius. Um, but it gets back to the human being moving through space with his or her own power on, a f on foot or on a bike, I think. That's the basic fundamental. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, uh, I might uh, move, move to a larger and more metropolitan scale, and uh, I, I have to, I, I, should, I should acknowledge that we have sitting right, right in front of me Bob Rubin, who's not only uh, the most provocative thinker, I would say, on, on suburbs and suburbanization, but has a, a perhaps perhaps would dissent strongly from, from what I'm about from what I'm about to say. But the to me, the you know, the essential wisdom of of urban design, really, you know, like everything I do, goes back to the 19th century uh, utopian Ebenezer Howard and the Garden City movement, uh, mm -hmm. and Howard, you know, what Howard was saying is that. The right way, you know, we're going, as Doug was saying, the right way, you know, we're going to expand the cities. And it's actually, in its way, a good thing. Uh, it's a necessary thing, whether it's good or not. But, you know, Howard's message from back in the 19th century was, you know, you don't, uh, you don't simply sprawl out. But instead, there is this more complicated uh, relationship. In other words, you expand outwards but in the form of relatively compact, walkable communities. That was the great, to me, that was the great lesson of, of mm -hmm. Hammerby. Uh, you know, that yes, you can, you know, you, that scale, to me, is the right one. And I think that even a place like China, uh, where you say, well, oh, they have to have these, these massive buildings. If China had the right kind of regional planning, the Hammerby scale would work fine, I think. That, you know, sprawl in the United States, uh, you know, these massive inhuman uh, tower blocks in China are, in a sense, uh, embodiments of the same, same error. The inability to think in this complex way. You have to expand, but also maintain the human scale, as Doug yeah, says. Yeah, and, and by the way, some of those super blocks in those Chinese cities have within the super block sure. shops, schools, you know, clinics, and so on. So they, there's a certain amount of walkability within the block, but not between the blocks. They're riv big rivers of asphalt that usually have pedestrian bridges to cross. Um, so they're islands, but they're fairly complete islands. They're getting more complete. Because um, they have a traffic congestion problem. They know that the more people that walk and bike, the less driving. And I have to say, I didn't recognize Bob. I, I totally disagree with him. <laughs> <laughs> I've read his work, and I have lived in the suburbs. I've cut lawns in the suburbs. I, I, 
Well, it depends on what kind of suburb. But I've lived in some that uh, it could be destroyed as far as I'm concerned. Not literally, but not to be copied. Sorry. Well, um, so maybe the next question would be institutional barriers for especially the scale of urban design. Uh, right now, I think the field is going in two ways. One is ad hoc tactical urbanism route, where we see actually designers adopting more of that. Uh, but there's also a critique of that saying it reinforces the neoliberal agenda in the sense that it accepts the state or the municipality or the city to withdraw completely and based on this opening up of new space for designers. So how much of it is our responsibility and what's the institutional barrier here for going forward embracing places uh, like the, the model communities that you've mentioned. So what part of the institutional problem you think is the biggest obstacle for specifically urban design? Because architecture and urban planning, I want to kind of separate them here, but yeah. the position of urban design, I think, is unique in the sense that it doesn't have this institutional, clear institutional attachments like the other two does. So like, what do you think the main institutional barrier here? I mean, more of the, the young urban designers go off and become tactical urbanists, create their ad hoc solutions and work with communities, but do not really create a, a mainstream impact or uh, an impact on the legislative structures of how cities should go forward. If you want to pass, I can take a shot. Sure. Or do you got um, an... I, I certainly don't want to pass. Okay, but I mean, if you <laughs> want to formulate... Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I mean... I'm going to, of course, attack neoliberalism because neoliberalism just means whatever is bad. But, but, uh, but I think that the, you know, that the, the pro, you know, just to take the United States, the, you know, the problem, as I tried to suggest, it's not, a pro, you know, it's not a problem in urban design per se. It's a problem in the paralysis of the political state especially to mobilize resources for, you know, for the infrastructure, especially the, tra the alternative transportation infrastructure that we need. And again, I don't, you know, I'm in awe of Eisenhower and the, you know, what, what the, the 1950s federal government accomplished with uh, the interstate highway system in the sense of providing a, you know, a, a, a transportation backbone. Uh, and I'm shocked that we simply can't move on from that to, you know, to the kind of mass transit infrastructure that we need. Uh, I don't know, you know, I wish I knew what has happened to this country that has made it so difficult for us to do, you know, we did the interstate highway system without even borrowing a cent. It was done, you know, out of current uh, tax revenues. Hmm. Uh, the biggest public infrastructure project in the history of the planet yeah, is yeah, our interstate right. system. And now we can borrow for essentially nothing, and we're doing nothing. Hmm. Well, I, on the local level, I think one of the big obstacles is zoning and the nimbyism that hides behind zoning, hmm. that neighbors don't want their real estate values to go down, they don't want people moving into the neighborhood that aren't like okay. them. NIMBYism is a big, big problem. I don't know if it is in Chicago, but it is certainly where I live. Um, and uh, zoning is the thing they hide behind. You know? <laughs> so changing the zoning, like Minneapolis, is have they just eliminated all single family dwelling area zones? And I think Portland's about to do it, or sort of have already done it. I think it's a great idea. Um, Accessory dwelling units, fabulous, low-hanging fruit, a really good way to improve suburbia. Allow those homes to have not one but two accessory dwelling units, attached and detached. Some cities are allowing that as they eliminate single-family zones. It's the lowest hanging fruit we have in terms of affordability or accessory dwelling units. I think the big suburban mansions are going to be subdivided in your lifetime, just like old urban mansions were subdivided, and many 
apartments and condos. That's going to happen to those big suburbs. They're going to be subdivided. And they're going to have, I hate to tell you, abandoned cars in their front yard and stuff like that. It's not going to be pretty. I think it's going to go from McMansion subdivision to suburban slums. I think they're the future slums. Yeah. So, you know, these Asian developing countries used to copy <coughs> the American model, including suburbia, until they realized it wasn't working. And now they look to Europe. They don't look to the United States. Because uh, Europe, frankly, has 100 great cities. How many great cities do we have in America? You live, yeah, you live in one of them. I can, my guess is you could have you'd have trouble naming more than 15 great cities. I mean, cities that people flock to. Um, whereas in Europe, they're all over the place. It's just, so there isn't this big demand put on the San Francisco's, the Boston's, and the Chicago's. Land development in San Francisco is now 81% of the development cost of a new project. There's so much demand to be, and, and there are three or four other uh, 
California cities which are in the 70 percentile. Um, it's because we don't have enough good places. Everybody wants to go to this limited list and land values. Think of that. Four out of every five dollars is going to buy the piece of land. And the dollar left over is what you build with. I mean, this is not sustainable. Uh, yeah. Can I make well, a quick announcement? Uh, if you ask me a question, it's a good idea to come here and speak into the mic. This is being recorded <laughs> and broadcasted live, uh, both by Chicago Area Network TV and UIC uh, Digital Service. Oh, in that case, I take everything back, I said. <laughs> <laughs> Please come and speak into the mic and keep the question crisp and short. Thank you. Here. We can talk. Well, um, the, I'm John Norquist. Uh, I'm the uh, former mayor of Milwaukee and the former head of the, of the uh, Congress for the New Urbanism. And I was in the United States Army from 71 to 77, so don't mess with me. Okay. Um, uh, to answer uh, Bob's uh, question about uh, why, why sprawl is so common and why is it so difficult to do what... As I've been to Stockholm many times being of Swedish descent and having and I wonder at how great it is there. Um, I think one of the biggest problems in the U.S. Uh, gets back to uh, Bob Bergman's... The book I read, I don't know if... You've probably written lots of books, but the, when he and I debated... And uh, I, uh, I thought I did okay, but I, afterward, he did, I thought he did well enough that it penetrated my armor. And what really occurs to me, occurred to me, and even more so now, is that people that were wanting good planning and uh, to deal with declining CO2 and stopping sprawl and all that, a lot of it was administering pain, uh, telling people they couldn't have what they wanted. And people do, under many circumstances, prefer to have more space. Uh, it's something that people, sh because they think like that, they shouldn't be slapped in the face and say, don't ever think that again. Uh, and you have to deal with that. And so Minneapolis is a good example of instead of limiting people, in Minneapolis now, your single family zoning gets changed and now as of your own volition, you can have more room and more property, uh, I mean more uh, building on your, I think it's three that they can add, uh, three units you can add, they wouldn't all be separated, uh, but uh, so that created more freedom and I think uh, that's an argument that needs to be addressed, that Americans uh, shouldn't be offered, uh, you know, either, either we constrain ourselves and live in much smaller areas and bike more and stop driving, or you die. And I think that's what bothers conservatives so much, and they end up believing the unbelievable. They deny climate warming, and it the pro-life movement supports a president who wants to have more CO2 and take a risk on just ending human life on the planet. That's very, you know, makes you mad. But on the other hand, if conservatives are just offered do it our way or, or you know, that's it, uh, that doesn't work very well. So we have to take the benefits of urbanism and hold them out there and say, you know, life can get better or to the way I would put it to Al Gore, the convenient remedy to the inconvenient truth that he wrote about is to have uh, better ways of living that use less fuel, particularly the transportation thing, which he has always tended to ignore. Well, thank you. Thank you for your input. What do you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to the question. So uh, before we open it up to, to the floor, maybe one last question, because you already mentioned about climate change you're in your presentation and your book is about climate change and its effect, uh, city's effect on that. So maybe a question would be for future urban designers, 
is like we already have discussed streetscapes as infrastructure since 1970s we are thinking of ways of improving streetscapes that's actually almost a register a given in any uh, urban design manual the municipalities students know that by heart that they have to pay attention to the streets and and the surrounding tissue they also know about mixed use right that's something that we have been enhancing and saying that that should be a part of uh, a, an ideal community, mixed use. So these are some of the registers I believe have somehow, especially in the profession, settled and found their ways. But I'm wondering what your thoughts are on future registers, especially with climate change. Um, you've shown examples from all over the world. They have very different contexts, backgrounds, colonial histories, timelines. Some of them are rapidly urbanizing and some of them are shrinking, losing population. But one thing that's common to all is climate change, right? They're going to deal with it in similar ways or maybe not deal with it. So what do you think is the register that we have to develop together with future urban designers, both in profession and also at schools, for dealing with these complex problems of climate change, which most of the time we don't really understand how it works? Yes. Well, do you, do you know this book, Paul Hawkins wrote some interesting books. His latest is called Drawdown, and he gives the 82 ways to draw down carbon in the atmosphere to fight climate change. Number one is changing the chemistry, the chemicals in all the air conditioners, which are the single biggest, that's the lowest hanging fruit, most cost effective thing. Changing the chemicals. The second is wind power. I think food waste is the third. This is bigger than solar. Food waste, tremendous amount of methane and CO2 comes out of food waste. And then there are other things like educating girls. He says girls, not women. Educating girls ranks above rooftop solar because they have fewer kids when they're educated. This is wor worldwide. This is not in just the US. Uh, a plant-based diet ranks higher than rooftop solar. If you add rooftop solar and solar, uh, you know, what's the other, um, other solar, it's much higher. But they, he separates the two solar, so it's further down. But who would ever guess that education, food waste, um, a plant-rich diet, would have such an immense impact on solving the carbon problem. Uh, and the rest of the list is fascinating as well, but people were shocked, and yet he had a team of 170 or so PhD, PhD students working on this. I think it's pretty authoritative. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> I think that's a, really, that's a really good list, and I, I would only add that uh, <clears throat> This, this perhaps uh, 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 gets, away, gets away from your, you know, at least the, the constructive part of your, the constructive part of your question that, that uh, whatever we think about sprawl in the United States or, you know, or East Asian development, the challenge for the lifetime of the students who are starting in this program is going to be uh, informal settlements and especially the urbanization in Africa, that Africa will be the continent uh, that, you know, that will be the last to have this, uh, you know, this tremendous jump in population. That will basically dominate the, you know, the, the, world, wor the world's issues. And when you co combine that with the fact that, that urbanization in Africa is almost, <laughs> is almost sure to be dominated by informal settlements, you come to, I think, what will be the agenda for, not just for urban design, but for global politics in your lifetime. You're absolutely right. The UN projects Asia will grow by 400 million, Africa by about a billion. Now, I don't think either is gonna happen. I don't think the planet will support that. But Africa is growing wildly fast, and it is in informal settlements. They say, though, that if you put down the grid of infrastructure and streets initially in those favelas, which usually doesn't happen, they're random, but if you lay it down 
with small blocks and decent infrastructure and all that, that they can actually evolve into uh, workable, livable, good cities. It's just when they start out in a scattered format that they're really hard, then they get invested in that and it's very hard. So if they have the presence of mind to lay it out, even without the pipes, but it, just the right-of-ways, um, they can evolve. I mean, after all, the cities in Europe that we love started out as, as poor communities initially. So I, I don't think the favelas necessarily are a problem if there's some intelligent planning at the outset, which will have to be done by the government. I don't think the inhabitants themselves have the time or wherewithal to do that. So favelas, though, or informal settlements, slum, whatever you want to call them, are a big, big part of Africa's future and, and in parts of Asia and South America as well. Uh, but they can evolve if they're laid out with some thought. Okay, well, thank you. Maybe it's time to open that up for audience questions. I'm sure you have many, so we have these uh, wonderful speakers here. I think there was one question here. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Bridget Williams, simply a member of the public today. Uh, and um, earlier you responded to the institutional barriers of replicating something like Hammerby. I'm wondering if you can respond to the ethical barriers of um, replicating something like Hammerby, for example. Um, before they built this sort of sustainable utopia, there were a lot of industries there, and those people who worked in those industries don't live in that community. Um, they didn't preserve buildings, they built new. Um, so I'm wondering if you can just respond to that. Well, thank, <laughs> thank you for the, uh, for, the, for the question. I mean, the, uh, again, I mean, I think the ethical issue there uh, you know, was the you know the issue you know the the Swedish government wanted to develop relatively you know they didn't want to go ten miles out they they wanted to stay close that was what they saw as the as the uh, the error of some of the uh, post some of the earlier new towns so they did find a place that had you know that was you know a beautiful lake surrounded by you know failing, I, I would call it failing light industry. There, there weren't many people there. I mean, as you know, it was, as opportunities for, you know, for, for redevelopment go, I think it was unusually, uh, un an unusually good one. Yeah. And in this sense, you know, I would say the end justifies the means. That, uh, that you know, the outcome uh, has to be factored into where you know yeah. where you start? I mean, I think the problem with having me, uh, it's not as affordable as the you know as the sweet as as the government of Stockholm thought. They hoped for a 50-50 split between a for, between rental and condo. It's it's two thirds private ownership. Uh, it just became so popular with young couples, especially that it's just not the affordable place that they hoped it would be. And that gets back to one of Doug's problems, uh, Doug's issues and mine, which is that, uh, you know, when you do these things as one-offs and they succeed, they're, gonna, you know, they're not gonna be affordable because they're so good. Yeah, they're not enough of them, but I've been to Hammerby more than once. Um, I don't think they displace that many people. I don't think that many people live there. I don't know how much industry either, but, uh, Knowing it was um, a very progressive country, I bet they compensated anybody they moved. Thank you very much for all the presentations and discussions so far. Uh, very interesting. One thing that struck me as um, I think we started the discussion is something that Bob mentioned and showed actually the uh, that place uh, that is I don't know if it's periphery of uh, Stockholm or close enough it's part of that yeah, metropolitan region yeah. and it what really struck me is that that was the everyday I would say the environment of 
um, everyday life. It's, it's the environment that actually takes most space, that a lot of attention in terms of design, possibly even planning, is given uh, in terms of high quality is given to places of gathering like plaza or main streets and so on. And paying attention and making sure that there is a high quality environment of that replicated everyday space where majority of urban tissue is actually, I think that's what struck me from that uh, photo and that example. You know, it seems like place that does take care of ecology, takes care of access and I would imagine, and hopefully it takes here also of affordability, but that's the massive, actually, if you think of the proportion of urban environment, that's that everyday place, and actually paying attention to the craft and making those places high quality. So it's really, I'm not sure if it's a question, but it actually struck me, and how can we ensure that, that craft goes into these places, and actually this is where we can have the most of the impact, if you think globally, if you accumulative impact on the quality of the environment as a whole. So anyway, that, that connects to your question of scale. How, how do we yeah. build and uh, right. connect to the existing environment? Yeah, <clears throat> well thank you for that. Uh, just a couple of responses. Uh, in terms of the craft, what strikes me about this particular example is that uh, you know, the municipal planning and design office, offices, were allowed to do their thing and were allowed to really think through these, uh, these issues. And again, I think we, we underestimate the degree of expertise and idealism that exists in virtually every planning office, uh, certainly in Sweden and, and most tragically also here, that so people are so little given that opportunity. The other thing is they, they, did, they did find you know, a, a kind of strategy. It, there were very careful urban design guidelines. Most of the things you saw were built by uh, private developers for profit, but under, the, you know, under these very carefully thought out rules. And again, that's, you know, that kind of dialogue, I think, is you know, it's our equivalent of, you know, of traditional craft and of, you know, cities developing over time. So maybe a quick additional question here is that, is that the process designed by designers, do you think, is what makes Hammerby uh, an exception? Yes, I mean, as I say, it wasn't that it was a bunch of geniuses or that they were doing it for, you know, by, you know that it was all sponsored by some foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, they found the right process. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. I. I want to go back to your question because I think we skirted it a bit by talking about Hammerby. Displacement, displacement of poor people. It is a perennial, universal, and long-lived problem. It's been happening since ancient Rome, ancient Cairo, ancient Jerusalem. Uh, when a place is desirable, people are willing to spend more money to live there and the people who can't afford it get displaced. That's been going on forever. Wealthy societies like, uh, like uh, Northern Europe can probably afford to compensate those people. The US can. But much of the world, in Africa, they're not gonna do that. They don't have enough money to do that. But it, displacement is inevitable if you want better cities. Just inevitable. You can't keep everybody in place and, and make the sort of, uh, upgrades we've been talking about. So it, it's no fun being poor. And uh, the, the best solution is get those people better jobs, but few societies can pay them when they get moved and compensate them. I'll just sit here. Um, so my question is about uh, integrating like more discussions about uh, like power dynamics into the education institution, uh, power, so social power dynamics um, in the education institution uh, for students going into this field. Uh, we've talked about um, institutional barriers to, urban, to good urban design and um, sustainability. We've also talked about how did we get to this place where we, you know, built car centric communities and can't build walkable communities. We've also called neoliberalism just like it's this thing that's bad. And I think that's where this in, the institutions like UIC 
Um, and most of the ones that aren't UIC do a really bad job of really stopping at that point, right? This is neoliberalism. We get a mild critique of, of power dynamics and capital, and we stop a bit right there, right? UIC is lucky enough to have a course on political economy by Rachel Weber that I think provides a framework that is barely touched on um, throughout the rest of the courses that I think need to be informing the rest of the classes that we take. And I think the, the result of not integrating an idea of political economy into our studies results in a culture of how did we get here, right? Not understanding our context, and that leads to you know, our global politics being dominated and held hostage by white supremacists or whatever you want to call it, right? We don't need these buzzwords necessarily to understand this problem, but like, how do we institutionalize more of a nuanced understanding of the power dynamics that us as students are going to be walking into that I think academics feel really comfortable talking about, but you know, we're going to go into a community meeting and some person's going to stand up and the analysis that they're coming from is just dog whistles for racism and we're not going to and if we're not prepared to go into that environment and have an understanding of what we're encountering, I think it's doing a disservice to the entire uh, field of urban design. And I think urban designers especially, we're coming from architecture, we don't, we don't take political economy classes uh, in our undergrad, right? So how do we do that as an institution and prepare us for those problems? Good yeah. Well, I, I certainly agree that uh, one solution would be uh, for everyone to take Rachel Weber's course. <laughs> Real, I mean it. But failing that, fa fa failing that, I mean, I think that, yeah, well, one somewhat hopeful thing is that I think there's a critique, a kind of self-critique of, you know, of urban design. And, uh, I, since I'm not an urban designer, I can say this, that, that uh, the weak, you know, to me, the, the kind of inherent weakness is just the faith that a good design solves the problem. A, you know, a faith in the rendering. You can come to the right rendering and the plan, and that's it. And, and so many of our, say, socially engaged studios, you, you, know, you come up with this wonderful plan, this wonderful rendering, and then you walk away because the semester is over. And to me, the solution, though it's a very hard one to do in the context of, an, you know, of academia, is long-term engagement, you know, is making, you know, as part of, of the, the study of urban design, long-term engagement uh, you know, with specific communities, where the idea is that you're gonna learn from them. In other words, that, that they, you know, that you're not there to provide the solution. You're there to learn from them and to perhaps help them in the way they want to they wanna go. And I think if that experience was part of every, every urban designer's education, that would at least be a beginning. And, and that requires a skill set. Unlike urban planning, you have to be able to conceptualize and create in three dimensions. Planners are more policy oriented. Architects are entirely preoccupied with form, but uh, you need, why we need urban design, it bridges the two, but it does it in three dimensions. That's the difference between that and planning. So it's important that the urban design studio be three dimensional, but at a larger scale than the individual building. That's the whole point, it's three dimensional at a larger scale than an ensemble of buildings or an individual building. That's in terms of skill. Uh, these bigger, deeper issues of, you know, political, social justice and so on, I mean, they're beyond our scope probably today. Um, that's a bottomless pit of questions, but you obviously have to be concerned about that. Um, I mean, when I graduated, I worked in what was then politically correct to call the ghetto for two years as a VISTA volunteer. We weren't considered honkies then as we would, well, maybe you don't even know the term honky, but um, it had its awkward moments. Uh, and this whole, I mean, racism is so deeply embedded in American culture. It's a, I, uh, 
these socio-political questions are bottomless, and um, this country was born with some serious injustice, and it's, it may die with them. It may be what brings us down in the end. Hi, uh, my name is Trevor. I'm in the MCD program, uh, trained in architecture. And my question is, um, what do you guys think it'll take as you know, future designers of cities in the world, frankly, um, to make these impacts? Because it seems like we have, we've had these discussions, we have, it seems like we have answers and ways to implement them. But you know, frankly, um, as a young you know, student designer soon to enter the work field, it seems like we really don't have as much power as we should or that much influence to make the changes that we want to make and need to happen. I mean, designers have never had that much power, whether it's at the architectural or urban design or planning scale, um, they're instrumental instruments of, of bigger sources of power and wielders of power. I, it's, it's just another ongoing give and take that you do your best in that tug of war. Um, being able to s explain yourself well actually helps in, in the public discourse. And doing beautiful drawings helps and so on and so forth. But it's basically a political battle in the end. Who prevails? Whose values prevail? Who spends wh whose money and how much? And it's inherently political, unavoidable. This is not new, by the way. This was true in ancient Rome. Question. I had a question about uh, maybe the point is that urban, when we talk about urban design, we are trying to make a new experience for the people who are experiencing environment. And a, part, a big part of people's uh, involvement with the environment is transportation infrastructure or mobility infrastructure. Most of the discussion that we had about urban design and transportation infrastructure was about TOD. What do you think would be the next step? Can we talk about influence of urban design in inside the trains or in different stations rather than mm -hmm. only TODs? Well, I mean, station design is, pure, is within the architectural realm. Um, transportation systems are within planning and urban design somewhere in between. I, um, you mean how do we get to the scale of design? Is that what you're saying? I'm not. Uh, public realm, yeah. Yeah, this is a good question. Uh, usually, urban design is concerned with the public realm, public space, and yet we spend more time in private space, and that's more in the architect's realm, in interior designer's realm. Uh, so when you walk through that door, whether you're going inside or out, there's a big change. Um, I think we just need better, better architects and better urban designers and planners who can make that jump. Um, craft, someone asked about earlier, craft to me is primarily exhibited at the smaller scale of the actual building and interiors. Um, so we need that. We, it's just a continuum that we need people to bridge across, and urban designers are bridgers um, more than architects. Um, but I'm not sure, I don't think I'm answering your question. You want higher quality interior space? In The 
way I interpreted your question is like how we, we can extend the impact of urban design from the public realm into trans in places like transportation where people actually public transit where they spend most of their days at. Mm -hmm. So like how can we think of new smaller scales of engagements, right, in urban design, which it, which doesn't stop in the park or the square or that's or the station space, yeah. Is there a way to think around that? Yeah. Well, well just just to, to start from the way to th the way to think about it, uh, you know, to me one of the most remarkable exhibits in the Henry Ford Museum is the Rosa Parks bus. Mm -hmm. They actually have the bus that, you know, that she, where she refused to, to sit at the back. Uh, and you know, it reminds us that that space is public space. That is, you know, that, that in, in some ways these, you know, the, the, the spaces of, of transportation or our most important, of, of public transportation are our most important public spaces. That, you know, that a certain kind of interaction takes place that doesn't, doesn't take place anywhere else. And I think when you, you know, when you look at it in that way, you see the, the quote unquote transit system uh, in a different way. And what to me is most, ho one of the most hopeful things is that I think a lot of people are seeking out transit because they want that public experience. They, they want to make it, you know, they want a deeper connection to the city precisely by being on the streets and in the, in the buses, on the subways and so on. And that is, you know, that, that is, you know, I mean, Urban design has one great thing going for it, and that, in that people really love cities, and you know that that you will have you know in terms of skills at least the potential to give them what they love. Yeah, I mean, people watching is as natural as bird watching in the countryside. I think the urban experience is is so multifaceted and so thorough, but I've just run out of gas. This is my second <laughs> s conference today. Sorry. <laughs> Running out of gas is not a bad thing, though. Drive less. <laughs> <rest. laughs> well, any more questions from the audience before all of us run out of gas? Yeah, OK. Yeah. 5.30? Okay, we're fine. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Uh, I'm Rananjay. I'm from India. I'm an architect, and the faculty here has done an amazing job to make my five years of education feel pretty obsolete. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so learning about urban design has really changed my mind, and I think that architects really need to be a little more in touch with this, which correlates to what was discussed earlier about the education system. But my question here is, uh, from what we've read till now in our classes and from my basic understanding, is that urban policies and what urban designers want to bring into the world usually is slower than how fast the world is changing. If you look at the slide right behind you, by in 20 years, the CO2 emission is going up by more than threefold. So uh, do you think, and you have worked in these, you both all have worked in this field for very long. So do you think in the future or the things that are being proposed now are going to be enough to be able to tackle with the fast pace changing that is going to come even faster in the future? Yeah. Okay, well, uh, the one thing I, I always do, you know, I'm surprised at myself. I, I haven't yet quoted Lewis Mumford and <laughs> the, uh, yeah, Mumford had such a wonderful response to that, and that is that one of the valuable things about cities is that they, you know, as containers that last beyond their generation, they preserve elements that can, you know, that are you know, precise, you know, that are lost in this fast-paced change. In other words, there was a time not too long ago when people just had, you know, they had no use for sidewalks, they had no use uh, for, you know, I mean, for, for all kinds of urban spaces, but the spaces survived. And they, you know, they provided a bridge to, 
uh, a more complex future. So in that sense, I'm not, you know, I speak as an historian, I am not at all, uh, you know, I love the way uh, city, uh, you know, the city, the permanence of city form preserves uh, things that seem discordant and out of place, but give a special flavor uh, to, to life. So the whole issue, I think, is trying to comprehend you know, what should be changed and what, what can't. One of the great things, you know, when, when the designers of Hammerby designed Hammerby, they looked first at old Stockholm and, you know, and learned from it. So, you know, that complexity, a city is about complexity of time. Are you also asking about sort of climate change, the ability to deal with climate change? I, you know. There's a moral difference between how we, how fast we innovate yeah. versus how change is happening. Um, I think we can only slow climate change down. We can't stop it and reverse it. I think you're in for a pretty wild ride, <laughs> any way we cut it. But we can slow it down and make it more livable and save not millions of lives, not tens of millions of lives, but hundreds of millions of lives if we do it right. But it's not gone away. We've got too much baked into the system already. There's just so much, so many greenhouse gases already in the system, and they have long half lives. And it's so it's going to be wild. I think is the nicest way to put it. It's going to be a wild ride, but a lot of meaningful stuff happens in wild rides. Um, maybe more meaningful than our more complacent, easygoing lifestyles of today. So I think there are silver linings. Um, but it's, going, it's, just, it's a challenge larger than humanity has ever faced. I'll end on that note. Well, I guess that was the last question, and we thank the, the speakers and the audience for being here. It was a, a lovely, productive afternoon. And since we're all out of gas, maybe refuel with the reception. <laughs> yeah. We have a reception coming up. So thank you for coming, and we'll see you in the next events of the MCD program. Yeah. And thank I, you. I, I don't, I don't want to carry these back to yeah. Michigan. If everybody wants, to, I'm selling these at a discount. I have four left. <laughs> yeah. Great idea. Okay. Anyone? Okay. <laughs>